Great. Okay, so let me, um, as I said today, I'm going to briefly give a review of what we talked about last week, and then we'll go into talking more about um, presence, perception, and some on technology. And then at the, we'll have a short break, and then at the uh, second part of the class for about 30, 40 minutes, I'll go through a bit more about Lens um, Studio as well. So uh, last week, we talked about how computers have been disappearing into our um, uh, you know, from room size computers into our heads and hands. And one of the uh, goals of computer interface designers is to try and make the interface invisible. And there's a number of different ways people have tried to do that. So, so one is through Internet of Things, where you embed technology into the space around you. So Alexa is a good example of that, or uh, the Nest um, uh, smart uh, thermostat. But um, of course, for this class, we're really interested in uh, uh, we're really interested in virtual uh, reality. And in this case, you know, the, the interface becomes invisible because you've got a computer generated space that fills up your perception. So people use gloves and goggles um, to immerse inside this computer generated environment. And of course, we've also been talking about augmented reality. And, and in this case, again, the computer becomes invisible because you typically interact with the real world through uh, an, a display that allows you to see virtual content or, or digital content superimposed over the real world. And um, then we talked last week about how, in some, to some extent, virtual reality and augmented reality is complementary. And with virtual reality, the goal is to, um, to replace the real world. And so you want to have really realistic graphics. Um, whereas with augmented reality, even very minimal rendering is okay. You know, if you had a navigation app where you just had an arrow, a virtual arrow drawn on the road showing you where to go, that would be really, really useful and wouldn't require lots of graphics. Similarly, with virtual reality, you want to display a device which is a fully immersive with a very wide field of view. Whereas with augmented reality, even a non-immersive display is um, uh, could be very useful. And then with tracking, um, virtual reality because your whole experience is being generated by the computer, if, you know, as you turn your head, you want to be able to update the computer graphics. But if there's a, a only medium accurate, uh, accuracy in the tracking, or there's a bit of latency there, it doesn't matter because you can't perceive it. Whereas with augmented reality, you want to have a very high resolution traffic tracking and very low latency because of course if there's any delays in the system as you turn your head you'll easily perceive that because the virtual objects will appear delayed compared to the real world so you can see ar and vr is very uh, complementary we also talked about some taxonomies how you can put them into different taxonomies and one was paul milgram's mixed reality continuum where you um, arrange them uh, depending on how much the computer generates of your uh, real um your experience. So on one end is, is um, virtual reality where the computer is generating everything. The other end, the Internet of Things, where very little is being generated. Um, and then, of course, um, mixed reality really doesn't include those endpoints. So um, uh, actually, a pure virtual reality system isn't a mixed reality system, but extended reality does. So that's the difference between extended reality and mixed um, reality. And we also talked about some other uh, uh, taxonomies, one that which is becoming pretty hot right now is called the metaverse and some of you would have seen the announcement from facebook um, a couple of days ago about how they're going to have a whole group of people working on metaverse te technologies and they just announced a new metaverse division or something and so the metaverse really involves two axes uh, that um, uh, classify technology depending on whether it's um, simulation technology or, or augmented augmentation technology or whether it's uh, externally focused or, uh, or focused inwardly on, on the person. So you can see with this uh, quadrant, augmented reality is really technology that's externally focused um, and it's designed to augment the real world. Um, and um, uh, virtual reality is really a simulation technology and they're trying to simulate an, an, a world and it's really inwardly focused and it's trying to create a perception on the, on the user that they're in this environment. And then we also talked about life logging in mirror worlds as well. Then the second part of the tutorial last or which last week was really around history. And although AR and VR and mixed reality technologies may seem new, we, we talked about how they can go back hundreds of years and even you could even make an argument thousands of years, uh, depending on how you view artwork and how artwork is being used to create um, uh, immersive or experiences. So some of the key points on that timeline was um, Ivan Sutherland's uh, first head mounted display. This was really the first head mounted display that showed interactive graphics, um, or, and this was an augmented reality display, so not so um, almost uh, over 50 years ago now. And then 
Uh, Tom Furness was in the US Air Force working on the super cockpit program and developing essentially VR and AR displays for pilots to be able to help uh, them um, cope with information overlay. Um, around the mid 80s, the technology left the military and entered NASA and some universities and VPL was the first company to sell a complete shrink wrapped uh, VR system and here's the VPL headset with very, very simple graphics. Um, early 90s, Tom Cordell at Boeing coined the term augmented reality and they looked at how you could use virtual information overlay to uh, help with uh, wire, guy, wire, uh, wire bundling in the aircraft assembly. And this is one of the first VR systems I used. So you can see you had this uh, computer that was about $150,000, could draw only about 2 million polygons a second, and it had a 30 hertz VGA head mount display with the magnet tracking. So of course our, our phones are much more powerful than that now. And um, uh, if you've got, um, actually if, you, if you've got an Oculus Quest or um, similarly untethered headset, you've pretty much got all this technology squeezed into um, a display you can wear on your head now for just a few hundred dollars. So it's pretty amazing how, how far we've come in 25 years. Um, around that same time, people started developing the first um, outdoor augmented reality and wearable augmented reality systems where you can walk out in the real world. This is the work, um, the touring machine was from Steve Finer in Columbia University, and they had to have a big backpack computer plus a second computer for doing an important interaction and a, a GPS system, a huge amount of technology. And again, this has all been squeezed now down into a mobile phone or smart glasses. Um, in the... Um, Around that, turn, around that time, you started seeing the first commercial VR companies. So uh, with building things like um, uh, uh, arcade games and uh, turnkey VR systems and, and software toolkits. And um, uh, a few years later, uh, around 2000, we had this kind of VR crash where a lot of these companies went bankrupt. But mobile phones started growing in popularity, especially with mobile phones with cameras. And so that meant that uh, about 15 years ago, you could build the first mobile AR systems where you could uh, provide an AR experience on a mobile phone. And then a couple of years after that, we had browser-based AR using Flash. And so then we had this huge uptake in AR technology because people could have it on their phone or on their browser. And especially in 2008, when you first started getting Android phones with GPS and compasses, so now you could take AR outdoors. So it's interesting because this is about uh, 12 years after Steve Finer built the first backpack system. And you know, it took 12 years to go from having two computers and a big GPS system to something in the palm of your hand that could do the same uh, thing. So quite rapid advances. And then luckily now we're in this kind of second wave, which started 10 years ago um, with Palmer Luki um, and um, Oculus, of course, that had this incredible Kickstarter um, success and then were acquired by um, Facebook. And um, that really started the consumer um, AR, uh, second wave of consumer AR. And so now for a few thousand dollars, you can have you know, a, a, a pretty nice game engine uh, or game computer, which has 4 billion polygons a second, head mount display that's um, much, much higher resolution than the old systems I used and large room scale um, tracking. And in fact, I should update this slide. You know, if we did it VR in 2020, you'd, you'd um, have again room scale tracking, but all of this would be self-contained in, in the Oculus Quest or the, the Vive Focus 3 or similar head mounts. So now we've had this rise of consumer head mount displays. And then of course, um, about five or six years ago, we started seeing the social uh, mobile AR apps appearing like Snapchat and Facebook camera and uh, word lens from Google. Um, and then we've got some integrated uh, AR systems. The whole lens came in 2016 and the whole lens two, um, actually I should update that it's, it's already arrived. And that provides a pretty nice platform for doing um, uh, see-through augmented reality. And then on the mobile, we've gone away from using just uh, marker-based tracking and GPS to using a much um, better visual initial odometry tracking that allows you to calculate the uh, position of the mobile phone just by using visual features in the real world. So it's pretty um, amazing technology we've got access um, to. So the overall history summary basically is that in the 60s through 80s, we had 20 years of early experimentation. Then people started building uh, basic um, uh, technology that was needed to create uh, AR VR systems, uh, like just tracking and displays. And then we had about five years worth of the first commercial systems and tools being built. And then from 2005 onwards, we started to have more widespread commercial um, adapt uh, applications and commercial um, use. So that's pretty much what we talked about last week. 
I want to talk briefly about the business of AR and VR, and we'll probably talk about this later on um, in the class as well. But um, you know, in 1996, uh, we had this kind of um, uh, VR winter where um, we had a lot of companies that were set up, and then they and most of them collapsed. And um, I believe now that um, you won't see that happen again, and that's because it's not just about VR anymore. A lot of the technologies that are underlying um, mixed reality, um, like tracking technologies and, and computer vision technologies, are being combined into everyday devices. So that means we've got a huge potential business um, in those in that space. Um, there's a large amount of investment going into the industry right now, much much later, larger than there was 25 years ago. Um, very inexpensive hardware platforms. So so when I was you know first starting in, in VR pretty much you need a quarter of a million dollars to set up a VR system. So you can imagine if you're a game developer, there really isn't a lot of market for your games if, if um, the hardware costs a quarter of a million dollars. You know, the, at one point in time, there was really only a dozen or two dozen um, complete VR systems in the world. So not really a huge market. But now, you know, you've got millions and millions of head mount displays. So because off the back of these inexpensive devices like the, the Quest, um, the content creation tools are very easy. We saw that last week with the um, Lens Studio. When I first started doing AR, you know, it would take us three months, three months or more, to create uh, the illusion of a, of a cube appearing in the real world, fixed in space. And now with things like Lens Studio, you can um, do um, uh, yeah, in just a couple of minutes. Um, there's lots of new devices for input and output. And there's also a lot of proven use cases. So when I was during the first wave, there's lots of hype. People thought that you know, VR was going to solve um, world hunger and all these huge problems. And um, actually, in the, the 20 years since then, people have settled down to find out where the real use cases are. So there's obviously big markets in, um, in gaming, um, big markets in training, education, and um, uh, in remote conferencing, remote collaboration, and a range of other areas like that. And perhaps the most important thing is I think what's happening now is that there's a really big focus on user experience. And instead of being technology pushed, where people have been given a bunch of technology to use, companies are looking at how they can uh, try and improve the user experience and build around that. And we'll talk more about that uh, next week and the week after when we start talking about tools for rapid prototyping. But it's really about the user experience now. So let me drill down a bit deeper. So a good example of what, what you can do if you're building a... Um, um, building an AR um, product is uh, Pokemon Go. So some of you may remember when Pokemon Go uh, first came out, it was just um, crazy. I remember when, I guess it was five years ago, you would see um, hundreds of people gathered in public places all trying to play Pokemon Go. And this is really a killer combination of a very good brand, Pokemon brand, of course, um, a social app, you know, you could play together with your friends face to face and a mobile and geolocations and AR. So you, pretty much everybody in their, in their pocket had a device that let them provide um, a geolocated experience. And then combining that with an AR uh, piece and um, uh, the brand and social really made a killer application. Now, of course, those of you who play Pokemon Go will know that the AR piece actually isn't that essential to Pokemon. It was just kind of a nice cream on the edge of the cake. But what we saw with Pokemon Go was um, a huge, um, uptake. It was the fastest app to reach half a billion dollars in revenue. It took only 60 days after launch to reach a billion dollars. And um, even now, there's um, hundreds of millions of players of, uh, in um, the monthly active users in Pokemon Go, even though it's quite an old app um, now. So augmented reality um, uh, today you know, is a large growing market. I think the market last year in the US is about $20 billion. Many um, available devices. This, this, this also applies for VR, although I'll show you some different slides for VR in a second. So you know, you can have an augmented reality experience on a head mount display on a phone or a tablet, or even in your car on a head up display. A lot of developer tools um, um, like Unity or Euphoria, lots of applications. If you go onto the um, app stores, uh, you'll find hundreds of thousands of applications and a very strong research and business communities. So um, actually in October this year is the EISMAR um, uh, conference. And this is the top academic um, uh, AR conference. It's gonna be a hybrid conference this year. So if you want to um, see some of the best AR research in the world, um, you can either go to Italy and go and experience it in the flesh, or you can go online and see it online as well. But there are other conferences too. If you're in the US, 
Um, the AWE conference is a fantastic event for business uses of AR and VR, and that's um, starting again face to face. It'll be starting in uh, November, and that's in the Santa um, Santa Clara in the US. So it's a great event. About seven thousand people come to that. So this is the predictions around uh, revenue for, for AR. You can see um, the growth here, in particular the growth in enterprise. Um, oh, so yes, ask the conference. It's called, it's called Eismar, um, so yes, um, um, Eismar. Just do a Google search for Eismar 2021, augmented uh, reality. I'll put a link a little bit later. Um, um, so this is the predictions of revenue for AR. And you'll notice um, in the AR space particularly, about uh, two thirds of the revenue is driven by enterprise. So, um, you know, uh, developer tools or business um, applications. Um, and uh, the, this company, Artillery, uh, produces predictions every um, so often. And this is their predictions around um, AR glasses install base. There's only, actually that, not that many augmented reality displays compared to um, mobile phones, of course, you know, if you have a mobile phone in your pocket, you pretty much can have an AR experience. And so there's, you know, hundreds of, well, I guess it's probably one and a half billion or so phones on the planet, which could use to do AR. But um, they estimate that last year, about a million um, mobile um, phones, uh, oh, sorry, um, head mounted displays for augmented reality. And by 2023, 20, uh, probably about five, um, uh, five million or so. Um, which is small compared to VR, but of course you'll see in this case about two thirds of our consumer, but there's a big light blue chunk and that's the predictions around the Apple glasses. So every year people um, guess when Apple's going to launch their glasses and um, and uh, so far they haven't launched yet, but now the prediction is next year. <laughs> if they do launch next year, they're saying that probably have two million in sales by 2023. So that's the, um, that's the uh, AR install base and then also with mobile AR revenue um, it's growing very strongly so lots of um, um, apps like from to po Pokemon Go and um, other apps and so they're projecting about 26 billion dollar um, revenue in a few years time. Similarly in the VR space um, it's the revenues um, around the same as um, AR but um, should be increasing as well but the difference between AR and VR is that most of the revenue in the AR space comes from consumer revenue. So um, a lot in the um, gaming side of things and in the consumer hardware like the Oculus uh, Quest um, and a much larger install base. Um, if you look at the um, uh, Steam store, um, actually this is a bit old now, but as of November last year, there were about uh, 2 million uh, monthly um, users on um, Steam with headsets. Um, some of you, um, who, if you've got an Oculus uh, Quest, um, some of you um, will have got a recall notice where they were going to send you out a free um, uh, gel mask, I guess, because of skin irritation. And based off the back of that, people can estimate how many quests there are um, just um, installed. And it seems like there's between four and five million quests that have been sold um, so far. Um, and the projections are that by the end of this year, it'll be somewhere close to 10 million sold. So if you're doing VR development, that's a pretty good market to be developing into. Um, we've also seen a very large industry grow. So this, this is a, um, every year Digi Capital produces a landscape of the um, leading AR um, VAXR companies. Actually, this is a few years old now from 2018, but there's um, hundreds and uh, thousands of companies. Last year, um, because I live in New Zealand, last year we did a market survey of AR VR companies in New Zealand. And we found uh, more than 100 companies in New Zealand alone doing AR VR related uh, work. So it's a very big global industry. And then um, uh, just um, a few months ago, we had um, one of the latest, I think this is the first um, software unicorn for uh, VR, so Rec Room. Um, I imagine some of you, actually probably many of you play Rec Room. Um, so this is, can be played both on a um, VR head mount display or on a desktop. And um, they raised $100 million early this year on a billion dollar uh, valuation. So it was one of the first software companies, uh, VR software companies to get a, a unicorn status. I think, I think it may be, be the first. So, so that kind of gives you an idea of the industry. Um, we'll talk a little bit later when we start talking more about user experience about what, um, um, what types of applications um, AR and VR are, are good for and where some of that growth in the industry is, is happening. Um, so in conclusion, um, over the last week and this week, we talked about how VR has had a long, AMVR has had a long history. 
Lots of the key elements um, in terms of technology are in place by the 1990s and you know, tracking, display, input and graphics. Uh, and there's been a lot of support by industries and by the military um, and developing technology. There was a second, first wave that failed in the 90s, uh, mostly because it was too expensive, provided the bad user experience and poor technology. But there's a second wave now, and I think this one will be successful. Um, we've got affordable hardware. Actually, you know, um, once your um, you know, when your VR headset gets down to three hundred dollars, which um, in some cases is the cost of a, a, a very expensive restaurant dinner or night out, that's kind of gets to the point where it becomes um, uh, if you don't buy the technology, it's not because of the price; it's because of other other factors. Um, and um, so now that the hardware is affordable, you have a much, much better user experience. There's large commercial investments. So I just showed you about how Rec Room raised $100 million and a large install base, you know, um, one and a half billion people or more with mobile phones with uh, capable and, you know, heading towards, actually there's more than 10 million now. If you, if you take the uh, four or five million people with quests and another million or so that have um, riffs and vives and other head mount displays. And then you've got another 5 million or so that have, PlayStation VR head mount displays. Um, and of course you can add on top of that, the five or 10 million or more um, uh, Google Cardboard viewers. You've, you've got probably 20 or 30 million people that have access to VR headsets at any one time. So the big question is, will, will XR be a commercial success this time? And hopefully, um, I guess there's some of you in the, in the call today that are gonna help make that happen. So we'll see how it goes. So does anybody have any questions around that industry overview? What we're gonna talk about now is um, going on, oh, I'm just gonna skip that. We're gonna go and talk about um, perception now. So if you've got any questions, please put them in the, um, uh, the chat or you can raise your hand and ask a question. And um, somebody asked, has anyone tried uh, Enreal? So I've tried it. Um, it's um, it's super lightweight and comfortable. The field of view is very small, um, but it's it's very um, comfortable. It does require to be tethered to a um, mobile phone, so it's an example of a hybrid kind of AR system. But it's it's certainly um, something you can wear long periods of time. I also tried the North glasses. Um, the North glasses were um, almost indistinguishable from real glasses. The only problem is that they have to be custom fit for each person because they have a very very small uh, field of view. So um, I think the field of view on the North Glasses was less than 10 degrees. So my friend had a pair of, so I went to a conference, actually the AWE conference, and North was there selling uh, glasses. So a couple of my friends bought them and I had to try in three pairs before I could find one where the field of view, the eye position was close enough to my eye so I could actually see an image. So they had to be custom fit. Of course, North got acquired by Google last year. So that technology is no longer available on the market, but I think you'll see it appearing in some Google um, headsets in the coming years or so. Um, and she asked, asked where about costs of apps. Do you think it will remain the same or see free apps? Well, actually um, you can already see lots of uh, free apps. If you have an Oculus Quest, I don't know, probably a third of them, uh, the apps are free. Um, and then they have in, um, uh, in-app purchases, um, um, so um, so you're already seeing lots of free apps. Uh, same with mobile AR. Um, and then you have some premium apps where you, you pay, you know, if, you, if you've got a premium um, game, you might pay $30 or $40 um, for a game. Um, or the subscription models, um, the, um, I can't remember the name of the exercise app. There's a very popular exercise app on the Quest, which you pay $20 a month for, which some people were complaining about, but they said, well, it's actually less than a gym membership and it works just as well, apparently. So, so that's good. So there's different uh, business models you can use. Um, uh, Ajit talks us about um, health issues. Actually, we'll talk a little bit about that today. I'd say the issue isn't resolved. Um, and that's one reason why um, Facebook is in the process of sending out millions of um, uh, face masks um, gel face masks to put onto their headsets because it turns out some people wearing the Oculus Quest for long periods of time are getting um, skin infection. So they want to resolve that. And then another big issue is, um, is simulator sickness. And we'll talk a little bit about that today, but actually more later when we talk about VR. About a third of the people who um, use a VR headsets start to feel, uh, get sick. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. And um, so that could also be a very bad health effect. So, oh, Supernatural, yes, thanks, James. Um, that's a very, very popular health app, but relatively expensive, but large user base. 
so let's talk about perception um so this is this clip from the from the matrix morpheus is what is real how do you define real if you're talking about what you can feel what you can smell what you can taste and see then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain and so um you know reality around us we understand it uh, through our senses but there's two basic processes the first is um sensation where we've got a variety of um uh, uh, senses and neuro and, and uh, our nervous system in our body that collects information um, about the environment around us, uh, you know, senses like photosensors in our eyes and things like that. And then um, in our brain, we do a, a, a very huge amount of perception to interpret that information. So actually, we could have a whole class around um, perception and sensation, but we won't do that. But today I'm going to talk a little bit about it, just so you have a little bit of an understanding about what needs to be done in terms of building AR and VR systems. We we're trying to fool our sensory systems. So a very simple um, sensing perception model is like this, uh, where you've got the real world, um, we interact with the real world um, through, uh, and we perceive the real world through our senses. And then um, in our brain, we basically build a model of the real world based on um, what information we're getting from our senses and we build a perceptual model. And then based on that model, um, we will do some action. So for example, if somebody throws a ball at us and we want to catch it, then we will see the ball coming with um, our eyes. We'll build a mental model of the ball's um, trajectory. Then we'll tell um, our um, hands uh, to move and then we will try and grasp the ball and again when the ball hits our hands there'll be some sensation from our fingertips or whatever that we'll use to to grasp that ball so this is a very simple um uh, sensing perception model if any of you are a psychologist um, or have done studies in psychology you'll immediately be able to pull this apart and show how um, wrong it is but we'll talk in more detail about that a bit later um, so the goal of virtual reality is to make you feel like you're in a place that you're not. So it's trying to replace um, those senses. And so it's trying to create the illusion of reality. And so it's, it's really about fooling human perception by using technology to generate artificial sensations. So you have computer generated sights and sounds, but you also have more strange things. So here's a, a picture um, on the left of um, Adrian Chiok, and he's built a system that can simulate the sense of taste. So they put a little electric device on your tongue and you stimulate it and you can taste different things and then next to it is this um, headset with all these vials on it and these vials are used to simulate the, the sense of smell and so you can simulate other sensations um, as, as well so um, so the idea of uh, virtual reality is um, uh, inside uh, virtual uh, reality is to create um, is to stimulate all our senses but using uh, official means to do so, so using computer graphics. So there's a number of output devices that can be used to, to stimulate our senses, you know, like uh, head mounted displays or, or headphones. And then we still have that same sensing um, conscious action loop, but then um, the input devices capture our actions and map them back into the virtual reality. So there's this loop between input and output devices. So a very nice example of that is this um, project called Birdly. And um, Birdly was a, a or it is a multi-sensory VR experience that is um, designed to create the illusion of you flying like a bird. So you can see the person is lying on this um, this uh, mechanical contraption, and um, it's got some hydraulics and pneumatics. And so the person lies out there with um, head mount display on, and they can actually flap their arms. And as they flap their arms, the um, device measures the arm motion and also tilts in response and it moves your body to like a bird. There's also, um, of course, graphics and audio, but there's also a fan in front of you as well that blows and you, as you feel like you're, you're flying like a bird. So let me show you a video of this working. Ever wanted to soar like a bird over mountains or cities? That's what HTC Vive is offering at Computex, thanks to this very state-of-the-art virtual reality device. Birdly is a genuine bird simulator, letting you cruise the skies, flapping your arms to gain altitude, and twisting your arms to turn, dive, and even pull up. The environment is a little crudely rendered, but the overall experience is second to none, thanks to two very special features. The first is the articulated rig that lets you feel every single turn and dive. Second is surprisingly low tech, the fan that replicates the rushing of wind in your face. 
It'll even speed up as you dive, making it all the more real. Okay, I'm a little dizzy after that, but that was actually just amazing. You, you genuinely get a sense of flying. The arm movements feel bizarrely natural, considering I've never flown before, obviously. And the King Kong was a little unusual. I could have done more of that. So that's Burley. Um, ben, ben says he's tried it and he got sick. So I'm sorry about that, Ben. I tried it too. Um, it depends, I think, how you're flying or what you're flying through. One experience wasn't so good for me, but the second time I tried it, it was a much better experience. But the overall idea is that, you know, with in this case, you've got a multi-sensory um, VR experience that really starts to stimulate um, a number of your senses, um, you know, your, your visual audio sense, of course, but um, uh, with the wind, you are stimulating um, the feeling of motion. Also, because you're lying down and you're getting that feedback from the uh, platform, it, it creates a kinesthetic sense that you're really moving. So let's talk for a minute about um, presence. Uh, so uh, presence is a really, really important topic for virtual reality. And uh, Whitman Singer about 20 years ago defined presence as a subject experience of being in one place or environment, even when physically situated in another. So you can see here a picture of somebody standing in their living room and they feel like they're standing in this um, a magic environment um, somewhere. So um, the overall goal of, of VR is to create a, 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 pres a presence experience. And um, there's an important link though between immersion and presence. So, Immersion um, describes the extent to which the technology is capable of delivering an illusion of reality. And then presence is a state of consciousness. So it's a psychology, psychological state of being in the virtual environment. So actually, to have a presence experience, you don't necessarily have to have VR. Some of you may have been reading books and you suddenly feel yourself immersed inside that environment. Or you may, may have been listening to, um, to music or even going to the movies and feeling yourself really immersed in that experience. So immersion is capable of producing a sensation of presence, but, um, it, but there can be some times when you have an immersive experience, um, but you have a break in presence and you lose that sensation. So the, the goal of um, uh, a VR is to create a high degree of presence and make people believe that really in the virtual in environment. Um, and so how do you do that? Well, uh, one thing you do is, you, is use multiple um, uh, dimensions. So you can, uh, first of all, create a rich multi-sensory VR experiences like Burley I just showed you. Um, secondly, you can include um, uh, agents or characters inside the VR experience interact with you. If you go into VR experience and you, um, uh, and there's a virtual character that comes up and talks to you, then that will increase the illusion that you're really in the experience. Or a simple way is to, um, have a virtual mirror and then when you you see the you, you can see yourself in the virtual mirror and then you can also have the environment um, respond to you as well so if there are creatures in the environment or if you even try and pick up an object in the environment that increases your sense of presence because now you really feel like you're part of the environment it's a it's a hugely top, uh, complicated topic and um, but there are a lot of different factors that influence presence so for example the um, having a virtual body and being able to see yourself in the VR environment increases your sense of presence because you really feel like you're part of the environment. Um, uh, vividness, so being able to have a very good uh, uh, vivid display and clear colors and, and pro provides a much richer experience. Um, um, uh, being able to interact with other things, um, sensory realism factors, and in fact, some internal factors. So some people have a very vivid imagination and so they feel more present than others. Or sometimes VR uh, can be used to trigger experiences you've had in the past. Uh, for example, if, if you're an uh, outstanding um, athlete, um, maybe you're an expert kayaker and then, or you've been an expert pilot and then you go into a VR environment and you've got a kayaking simulation or a flying simulation. Um, if it's realistic, that may immerse you more into that environment because it um, helps trigger memories from that experience as well. Um, so so yeah, she's, um, he likes VR chat um, and certainly a yeah, VR chat provides a really powerful um, sense of presence or alt space VR is another one. When you're in VR talking to people and you can see their hand gestures moving and their face expressions um, changing, it provides a very powerful sense of presence. Um, so there's a number of technical requirements for presence. Um, you need to have a very fast refresh rate on the um, on the display, you have to have a very wide field of view, um, tracking that allows you to move around and through the VR experience, high resolution, very low latency. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more as we start talking about the technology and more. But I guess the overall take home message is that um, if you want to make people feel more present in the experience, you have to um, uh, be able to reduce the amount of um, disconnect between the, the, the virtual world and the real experience.
Um, so a really nice example of a presence experience is, is this project was done from University of North Carolina called the Pit Room. And in this project, you, you had a, um, two real rooms in the real world. Um, and um, um, you, you started in one room and you can see the picture at the top there, there's these white uh, walls. These are actually made of styrofoam. And so when you're in the first room, they carefully mapped the virtual room to these uh, styrofoam walls and they asked you to feel uh, the walls. So you really felt you're, you're in the real, virtual room. And um, so you had this haptic feedback from the walls and then you'd walk through a door and um, in the second room, you had the perception that you're standing on the edge of a pit and you can see the person there is um, standing with the VR headset and there's these planks that are about um, half an inch or an inch above the ground and they ask you to put your um, feet over the edge of the plank and so you can feel the edge of the plank and when you look down, it looks like a 20 foot drop or so and then what you're asked to do is um, you've got virtual balls in your hand you're asked to drop the virtual balls to try and hit targets on the floor there you can see the two targets in red and um, blue and then um, at the um, end of the experience they ask you to um, step off the plank and um, and they measured your heart rate to see um, how um, excited or nervous you were and, and what happened when you were asked to step off the plank. So this is a, a typical behavior. This is not from this exact um, pit experience, but it's from another um, similar experience. Okay, I'll stop that there, but you can see how people are getting scared. And in this experience, they had a very narrow plank to walk across. And in fact, if you want to try it for yourself, you can play the game Richie's Plank. And this is a game available on the Oculus Quest and on the Steam Store. And in this game, you go up an elevator and then you've got to walk out onto a plank that looks like it's 40, stories, uh, 40 um, stories up off above the ground. So let me show you the video of this one. So you um, put a, a plank in the real world if you want to, and then you measure out the length of the plank and then you calibrate it to the system. And then you go in the elevator and you push the top floor, you go up and um, then you can walk out and um, there's a plank there and you can walk along the edge of the plank. Um, and so um, we've done this in my lab and it's really amazing to see people's reactions. And of course, if you get a plank that wobbles a little bit, it's better like this. And then um, they have other um, parts to the experience where you can shoot missiles and you can drop things off the plank and things like that. Um, but the sense of presence is really, really strong when people are doing this because there's um, two things happening. One is they have a very strong visual cue, but also with your uh, feet on the plank, you get a very strong um, tactile or haptic cue as well. Like you can see this lady here is feeling the edge of the plank. And it's really only two inches off the ground. But to her, it feels like she's 40 stories up. And then you can step off the plank. And when you step off the plank, you fall. And you know, in our lab, we measure people's heart rate and the heart rate spike up as they fall off the plank as well. So some of the benefits of, of having that high degree of presence is, is it leads to really greater engagement and excitement and satisfaction. Um, and people are also more likely to behave like they will in the real world. So people that are scared of heights um, are, uh, in the real world obviously will be scared of heights in VR. Um, in, the, um, in the VR chat and other social experiences, um, it can lead to more natural communication and, and people use the same cues um, as they would in face-to-face -face conversation. Um, there's also a lot of active research being done in this area and um, in, the, in the chat. Um, uh, ben talks about how people describe immersion in different terms and about presence and so forth. So there's a, there's a big um, lot of research being done about the relationship between presence and performance. It's still unclear whether or not you have to have high presence to have good performance in VR, but for some things it could, could it help. So for training experiences, for example. Um, 
It's also important to notice that um, there's different ways you can measure uh, the presence. And it, it's a very subjective experience. There's a lot of debate amongst researchers about how to measure it. Uh, most commonly, people use self-reported questionnaires. And there's a number of questionnaires here from Mel Slater and Whitmer and others um, that have been quite well validated. Um, so you can uh, be in the VR experience, you can have the experience, and when you come out of the experience, you, you rate on a questionnaire how immersed you felt. Um, one of the, the downsides of that is that you have to do it um, after you've been in the VR experience. Although some people now are asking the VR questionnaires inside VR, which is, which is better. So um, other people now are using a continuous um, a measure. So one example of that is, is a slider that you can move um, uh, when you're in the VR and you can um, slide it up and down depending on how much presence is felt. So now you can measure people's presence over time rather than just the end of the experience. But more interesting, people have been looking at behavioral measures. Uh, so um, as you saw in that video with the, um, the plank and um, with um, the pit, uh, people have a lot of uh, reflex or flinch measures. So you know, if you're in a VR environment and um, a virtual character is talking to you, and then the character tries to slap you in the face, if you flinch back, then that probably means you believe you're in the same environment with that person. Or if something jumps out at you and have a startled response. Another measure which is becoming more popular now is to measure people's physiological measures. And we've done some research in that area. So you can measure things like change in heart rate or skin conductance or skin temperature to see if people really feel like they're present in the environment. Obviously, again, with Richie's uh, plank, um, you know, if your heart rate spikes up and you start feeling and, and as a sign of being scared, it probably means you have a stronger sense of presence. Um, it's also important to note there's different types of presence. So most of what I've showed you so far is spatial presence, the feeling that you're in another space. But with augmented reality, it's really about object presence. So the idea there is, is the feeling that the object is in your space. So, um, uh, so if you, if you um, want to um, see a virtual object in the real world, you know, how do you make it so that object really feels like it's part of your real world? So that's more about object presence rather than spatial presence. And then um, in those social VR and AR experiences, there's this idea of social presence, which is the idea that somebody is um, really with you in, in the real um, space. Um, uh, so Ben has a question here that thought moving a slider in VR might break the presence bubble. It could do. It depends how you implement that. Um, and um, so if you have a, in, in the virtual world, if you have a virtual slider as well, then actually moving the virtual slider in the virtual world um, and have it move a real slider may actually help increase your sense of presence. Um, and I've got a question also, um, do you think that this activity can heal people, for example, scared of heights? Yes, so VR can be used for um, healing. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about VR applications, but there's a lot of work done on VR therapy and, and how it could do things like a fear of heights or fear of spiders or other things. So to give you a couple of examples, um, um, uh, for object presence, there are a number of factors that um, make an object appear uh, real. One of the simplest things is to make sure you've got some shadows that match the shadows in the real uh, world. So you can see in picture A here, for example, there's a, um, a little real statue of the Christus um, from um, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Then on the right hand side, there's a virtual statue, but the virtual um, statue also casts a shadow that matches the real um, shadow. So you have to make sure the lighting matches. So that provides um, uh, increased sense of object presence. Uh, you can also have audio cues where if you have sound coming from a virtual object, and if you use spatialized sound that come from that location, that can feel a lot more real. Um, the appearance and lighting um, occlusion as well. So if a virtual object can block a real object, then that makes it look more real. Or especially if the real object can block the virtual object, which is technically a bit more challenging, but that'll again make the virtual object feel like it's really in space. So to give you an example of that, this is an old video, but it shows some early research done on photorealistic rendering for AR. So you'll see here a virtual uh, model. So there's a virtual model and um, it looks quite real because the shadows uh, look very realistic and the lighting looks very realistic. So um, it's got very soft shadows. Um, and so this shows the comparison before and after. So um, this is what the model looks like without any shadows on it. And it says obviously fake. Then when you light it um, with light from the real world and you put shadows, it looks much um, more realistic. And you can make the model out of different pro um, properties. So here's 
a virtual model that looks like it's made out of glass. And the cool thing about this is it reflects the lights going through it. So you can, um, it, it creates a really nice illusion when you look at the real hand through the model um, and you can see reflections from the real uh, world. Um, and um, the way that they do this is um, um, by acquiring light from the real world. So you can see that little ping pong ball that's a real ping pong ball in the, in the, in the real world in front of the model. Um, we look at getting reflections from that and then those reflections are used to map onto the lighting of the virtual object. Uh, she asks us about physics and collisions. Yes, that is another way to make objects presence increase. If you put virtual objects on a real table and they bounce off the real table onto the floor, it looks more real. So here's another example of a virtual couch that looks pretty realistic with shadows and lighting making it really real. Um, and then the other aspect of course is, is um, social uh, presence. And um, so, um, of course, um, the way we interact with people, uh, there's lots of te technology to support that. And on the top here, graph here, a chart here, you can see um, going from email all the way to face-to-face -to -face meeting. So when you're talking to somebody on the phone, you have this interesting experience where you feel like that you're um, in a separate space, but you're te together in that space. Um, and as you go to a video call and then face-to-face -face meetings, you'd increase the sense of social presence. So what makes a person appear real? Well, their visual experience, um, the audio cues, if you can hear sound coming from where the person is, if you can interact with them, um, touch, if you can reach out and touch somebody or feel them, and a range of contextual uh, cues. But Jeremy Balanson has this really great paper called A Systematic Review of Social Presence that talks all about this. And you can see on the bottom here two um, pictures. These are both from outspace uh, VR. So um, on the left, this is the, uh, I guess, version 1.0 of outspace VR, where they had quite simple characters. The right-hand side is um, the latest generation. And so you can see the characters are much uh, richer. They can give hand gestures now. They've got better face expressions and um, more realistic bodies and clothing. So you have a higher sense of social presence. But companies like Facebook are looking at how to increase this further. And in fact, they're doing some research how they can map your real face behavior into VR. So I want to show you a little video of that, which is here. So our teams have been working hard trying to take a photorealistic avatar and animate it in real time from VR. You can see an example here of two of my colleagues working on this problem, communicating with each other in VR. And this is what they would look like when they see each other in VR. Uh, <laughs> what do you do for exercise? Um, I like, I, oh, so I, I do yoga and then I do <gasps> boxing too. What kind of and yoga? Wait, okay, yoga. yoga and boxing. Yeah, there's a nice contrast <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what kind of yoga do you do? I do hot yoga. I, I love hot yoga. I knew it. Oh, my. Okay, so I'll stop that there, but you can see on the left-hand side that the video of the uh, real people. The right-hand side, this is the computer-generated um, avatars, and you can see it looks super realistic. Um, it, it maps face expression, eye gaze, and it really creates a really strong sense of social uh, presence. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more later in the, in the course when we start talking about collaborative AR and VR systems. But we've got um, technology coming on the market now that allows us to do that using a combination of face cameras and eye tracking and other technologies as well. And she so, yeah, says, maybe one day we'll have a class like this in VR. Actually, we could have the class like this in VR today if all of you had uh, VR headsets. Even if you didn't, we could put it to Outspace VR, but um, it's a little bit tricky to sometimes share presentation material um, in that environment. So that's why I haven't done it for this time, but it's technically possible now. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about a presence. I want to talk now about um, perception and um, what, um, uh, how humans perceive um, the real world. And then you'll see how that maps on some technology as, as well. So um, first of all, the main motivation is that to create a strong sense of presence, we need to understand the human perception system because what we need to be able to do is use technology to, to, to uh, simulate and simulate the sensory inputs and create that um, illusion of, of presence. So on the left-hand side, you can see a picture of some old VR hardware. This is actually the VPL system from all those decades ago. The right-hand side, a homunculus mimicking the human um, senses. So people oftentimes think that we have um, five uh, major uh, senses, and this is how um, an org organism obtains information for uh, perception. Um, so there's the sensation part, which is a somatic division of the peripheral nervous system, and the integration of perception happens in the central nervous system, so basically your brain. 
So there's a five common senses. Actually, there's more than five senses. Um, I thought I thought I, I saw somewhere on the web somebody said that there's at least 27 senses, maybe more than that. Um, and we'll talk about some of those other more abstract ones a little bit later. But today we're going to talk mostly about the visual sense and and then hearing and and sense of touch. And that's because um, sight, touch, and hearing. Um, capture the uh, majority of the perceptual information that we use. Um, over 60% of the brain, for example, is involved in vision in some way. And if you look at the um, percentage of the neurons devoted to each sense, you see that sight has 30% of the neurons. So there's some other lesson essentials as well, though. Um, one that's particularly relevant for VR is uh, proprioception. So the sense of what your body's doing right now. So if you shut your eyes and you... Um, 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 try and point at a spot in space, um, you can reliably um, repeatedly touch the same spot in space to an accuracy of about a centimeter or so because of your sense of proprioception. You know kind of where your body parts are. There's a sense of equilibrium or balance, um, sense of pain. Um, one of my favorites is satiety, which is a sense of being full. So once you're eating lots of food, um, you, your stomach after a while says, wait a minute, I'm getting quite full now. And that's that sense there. So there are many other senses um, as, as well. So let's talk about the sense of sight. Um, here's a, a very basic um, representation of the human vision systems. Basically, you have the eyes, which provide low level processing. Then that sends um, signals um, through the optical nerve to the brain that provides high level computation and perception and the cognitive aspects as well. So the main purpose of the human visual system is to convert visual input to signals in the brain. Um, here's a refresher about what the eye is. Um, the eye passes through the cornea and lens um, onto the retina. And then the photosensors in the retina convert light to electrical signals that are then sent down the optic nerve. There's some important things though. One of, one of the important things is the fovea at the back of the eye, which, which forms a blind, um, oh, and, and sorry, the optic nerve, which forms a blind um, spot. So um, in your eye, you've got rods and cones. Um, the, the rods are in the periphery of the retina and they can't detect color. They only detect um, motion and black and white imagery. So you've got about 125 million of those. In the center of the retina around the fovea, you've got the cones, about four to six million of those, and they provide color vision and day vision. So you've basically got this um, very small spot in the middle that you can see color very well and very large um, periphery that's uh, black and white. Um, and so this graph um, shows that. Uh, you've got um, color vision that's about 50 degrees um, from your center vision, and then um, black and white vision out to about 100, 100 degrees on each side. But you can test this for yourself. If you get up stand up towards a, a whiteboard, you can reach out with your hands as far as you can. You can make a mark on the whiteboard. And uh, if you look straight ahead with your eyes, and if you're looking at out of the, out of the corner of your eye at that mark, you'll see you can't perceive it's color or black and white because um, your eyes uh, can only, it's your peripheral vision, which kind of seems black and white. Um, one of the important things for um, augmented virtual reality is this uh, valence and accommodation. And this basically means this is how your eyes uh, focus on things. So of course the eyes uh, rotate uh, together, which is uh, the virgins. And then um, they also focus, which by deforming the uh, lens and the eye, which is the accommodation. And so um, when you've got uh, two eyes, you have this um, binocular disparity, so you can see different images of both eyes, and they help to write a stereo cue. And also the focus here um, um, helps um, provide that um, separation for foreground and, and background. So I want to show you a little demonstration of virgins and combination. And it's super important for AR and VR because it's one of the main technical challenges that have to be overcome in these headsets. Separately. First, as an object approaches, both eyes track it in a process called convergence. The size of the eyes in this example has been greatly exaggerated so that the subtle movement that takes place during convergence can be seen. Convergence of the eyes keeps the image of the object of interest centered on the fovea, the part of the retina where resolution is highest. If the eyes do not converge appropriately, diplopia, or double vision, occurs. Second. The pupil must constrict to restrict the entry of light rays diverging from a near object, since diverging rays cannot be bent enough by the periphery of the lens to make them fall on the fovea. If the pupil were to remain dilated, the image would be blurred. 
Finally, the shape of the lens must change, increasing its refractive index so that the light rays passing through it converge on the fovea. In distance vision, the lens is pulled at its equator by the suspensory ligament, so that it is relatively thin. When the muscles of the ciliary body contract, the tension on the suspensory ligament decreases, and this allows the lens to assume a rounder shape, increasing its power to bend light. As a result, the image is focused on the fovea. Combined convergence, pupillary constriction, and rounding up of the lens all function to keep an object in focus as it approaches the eye. Okay, so that shows you the virgin combination, how important it is to have focus. One of the challenges, though, with um, uh, VR displays is that you're trying to con convince people that a virtual object is much further away than it really is. So, um, for example, on this picture here on the left hand side, you can see an example of looking at an object in the real world and um, the eyes um, um, uh, do the uh, vergence so that they turn inwards and they focus on the real object, which is great. Um, but on the right hand side, you've got a, um, a VR system. In the VR system, you've got computer graphics that have separate images. So they, um, the eyes again try to, to verge on those images and, and to, um, and to um, you know, if, if, the, if you're creating the illusion that the image is one meter away or maybe 10 meters away, the eyes will, will move to look at something that is 10 meters away. But the problem is, that the graphics are being generated um, on, on a, on a uh, LED display or LCD display, which may only be an inch or two away from the eye. So then you can see in this graph here, the pictures are, people are focusing um, on a display screen, which is an inch away, but the eyes are trying to verge on it to look at a 3D object, which is supposed to be uh, 10 meters away. So this causes that what's called divergence accommodation uh, conflict. And um, so this um, can lead to many effects such as eye strain or, or, or similar sickness or visual discomfort as well. So in, um, in, in VR systems, you have to carefully, and AR systems, you have to carefully design your AR displays to try and reduce this divergence um, accommodation uh, conflict. Um, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but one of the way, main reasons people do that is um, by, or how they resolve that is by putting lenses in there so that they have a virtual focal length, which is one and a half or two meters away or something like this one as well. Um, so one of the other important aspects of, of the visual um, sense is visual acuity, you know, how quickly can you resolve things? And some of you have done probably eye tests in the past. Um, you will have um, had experience with having visual acuity tests. Um, there's several types of visual acuity um, where people can look at um, resolving things with dots or gratings or things like that. But a normal eyesight can see a 50 cent coin at about 80 meters, um, which basically corresponds to one sixtieth of a degree. Um, and the rough um, rule of thumb is that you need 60 um, pixels per degree um, to mimic the, the human eye resolution in terms of acuity. Then the other important thing of um, your eyes, of course, is you see stereo vision. So eyes are separated by uh, the pupillary distance. The average uh, human has an eye separated by about six and a half centimeters, um, although it can change. And if you're designing a good VR headset, you let people change their eye separation depending upon their um, eye separation. And of course, um, each eye sees different images and then they're fused together to create a 3D uh, stereo uh, view. So, um, you catch images from your left eye, from the right eye, and then the brain does a disparity uh, map. And then based on that, you get uh, stereo uh, vision. Um, one of the other important aspects is depth perception. And there are a range of different cues that are used to provide depth perception. Um, so there are some stereoscopic cues, so the disparity between left and right eyes. But there's also a lot of monocular cues, um, things like motion parallax or perspective. So even if you uh, uh, looking at objects very far away where there's little um, stereo difference, um, you can still get good depth perception um, from monocular cues. So for example, if you're looking at objects a long way away, you might have atmospheric effects like fog or mist or cloud that tells you that this thing is a long way away. Um, 
so here's some common depth cues. We've already talked about accommodation and, and uh, convergence. So these are depth cues provided by the eyes themselves. There's a motion uh, parallax, so near objects appear to move faster than objects that are further away. And then the binocular disparity or stereo effect. One of the interesting things though is that these depth cues all have different effects at different distances. So this is quite a complicated chart, but it shows on the bottom here the um, distance away from the person. Then on the, the, um, the uh, left-hand side is the relative effect of different um, uh, stereo uh, or depth perception cues. So um, for example, um, if an object is closer than 10 meters, then convergence and accommodation are really important. But if an object is further away than about um, 30 meters, then occlusion becomes a very important cue. Um, motion parallax is also important up to about, about, about um, 400 or 500 meters or so. And then beyond that, um, it's things like relative size and density as well. So we have many cues that combine together to provide a good sense of um, depth. So you can sum up, and here's, here's a, a chart that talks about some of the properties of human uh, vision. So like I said, the visual acuity is about, for 2020 is about one arc minute, so 60 pixels per degree. Field of view around 200 degrees. Um, for a monocular field of view, there's an, there's an overlap um, for stereo viewing of about 120 degrees. And if you want to build a system that had the resolution in the eye, you'd have to be able to capture about 580 megapixels or so. In fact, there's a super great paper I just came across this week, um, and I'll send a link in the, in the um, in Slack. But some people from Microsoft wrote this paper saying, creating the perfect illusion, what will it take to create lifelike virtual reality headsets? So they wrote this a couple of years ago, talking about what would need to have to create VR headsets that were indistinguishable from, um, from the real world. And they said compared to current head mount displays, we'd have to have six to 10 times the higher pixel density and 20 to 30 times higher frame rate. Um, so they made this little chart here. So you know, they say, well, typical head mount displays now, you have 90 hertz frame rate or maybe 120. But actually, because the eye moves so fast, you'd have to have a frame rate of about 1800 hertz. And then the, uh, the pixel density, like I said, is about 60 pixels per degree. That, that's for 2020 division, but actually many people have better than 2020 vision. So in that case, you can go up to 200 pixels per degree. And typical head mount displays now have, have about 10 to 13 pixels um, um, per degree resolution. We didn't talk much about dynamic range, but eyes are super great at being able to look at very, very dark objects and, and shadow and, and darkness, and also very bright objects. And so the dynamic range for the eye is about 96 bits. So it's one to, um, boy, I guess that's 100 billion. I can't, I think, no, it's 100, yeah, that's 100 million. So, um, and so that's um, compared to 24 bit color on typical head mount display. One thing the head mount displays have got done well though is that they do have the same stereo overlap of eyes. One of the interesting things they also said in this article, which, um, which um, I haven't got a slide on, but they said, of course, the problem is that if you're building a display that's 1,000 or 1,800 hertz, you have to have massive amounts of um, data um, and graphics capability to fill the display. So in their article, they, they talk about how long it will take for our graphics cards to be able to drive a display um, at that frame rate. And also, not only um, do you have this super high frame rate, but you've also got this much, much higher resolution. So you've got, you know, um, at least 20 to 30,000 pixels per eye you've got to fill in um, the display compared to just today's displays, which might be 1K by 2K or something like that. So um, you've got a lot of information to convey. And so they talk about in their article about how long it will take for graphics cards to get to that uh, point. Uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be at least 10 years away from that. Anyway, I'll post a link and I, I can, I think it's a really super interesting article for you to read if you're interested in, uh, how long before we can get um, uh, VR headsets that are indistinguishable from the real world. But I'll show you um, actually probably next week a little bit more about head mount display technology. And you'll see that actually there are some displays that are approaching that in some areas. Um, so um, if you're smart with your display design, you don't put pixels everywhere. You can put pixels just where the fovea is and then get very high resolution um, display um, uh, in that sort of case. So let's talk a little bit about hearing. Um, this is what your ear looks like inside the ear. Um, you've got this eardrum that vibrates and um, um, moves um, hairs in the ear to create um, um, sound. 
and um, and again stimulate the nerves inside the, the cochlea to connect to the brain. So there's different uh, thresholds for um, speech or, or, or audio perception. You can see that the ear is capable of hearing between 20 to 22,000 um, hertz and at different decibels of, of sound. And conversational speech is around uh, 400 or 300 to 5,000 hertz and about um, 40 to um, 60 or 70 uh, decibels. If it gets uh, too uh, loud, then of course you damage your eardrums and it's too quiet, you can't um, hear anything. One of the important things for AR and VR though is um, sound localization. So of course we've got two um, ears and because the sound takes a while to travel from uh, through the skull from one ear to the other, we can use that to localize the source of sound around us. So let me show you a video that talks about that. Localization is the ability to identify the origin of a sound in space. In order to localize effectively, sound should be heard with both ears. A sound originating from a certain location in space reaches each ear at a different time and with a different level. This phenomenon gives rise to level and timing differences between the right and left ear. These slight differences help listeners to localize sound sources in space. Now, I'm not sure if any of you were listening to this on headphones, but if you were, when he said the left or right ear, you would have heard the sound in the left and right ear. And when the, you had that sa the sound of the conversation at the end, you would have heard a male speaker speaking on the right hand side and other speakers on the left hand side. So um, we have a, quite a good ability to, to, um, to uh, distinguish speakers by using sound localization. Um, and in particular, in the, um, the horizontal uh, plane, we can detect um, sound sources quite accurately. Um, once the sound comes behind us or above us, it becomes less, less accurate to detect. Um, and when people, um, oh, Evan said there's no audio. I'm sorry if that, Evan, well, you can listen to the video later or, or watch the video on YouTube and hopefully um, you'll hear it then. Um, the other interesting thing though is everybody has a unique ear print. So just like fingerprints, our canals are different for each of us. And so um, there's this function called the head lighted transfer function, which measures the ear's response to uh, audio. The way they measure it is they put a small um, microphone in your ear, then they play sounds from all around you and they measure the response to that sound. And once they've measured your head lighted transfer function, they can use that to modulate sound that you're hearing in, um, in, from the computer. So that creates a personalized uh, sound uh, source experience. And it's actually super realistic. So if you play computer games, oftentimes there's uh, spatial sound effects, but in this case, they use um, a kind of an average head related transfer function of the average hearer. But if you do have this done and measure your own ear print, it provides you know, a quantum order improvement in terms of the audio effects and you really believe the sound's already there. Um, so in terms of accuracy of sound localization, most people can um, accurately locate sound in front of them, less accurate to the sides and the head. But one of the um, um, common issues is this front back uh, confusion. So if, you, if you've got a virtual sound source that is supposed to be in front of you, about 10% of the time people think it's behind them rather than the front. Um, that's if there's no visual cues. Of, of course, if you have a virtual agent that's supposed to be speaking to you and you can see the agent in front of you as the lips moving, then that helps localize the sound in front of you as opposed to behind you. So in VR, it's really important to provide spatial uh, sound. And it's also important to provide uh, visual cues to go with the spatial sound to help lock that down. But the last thing I want to talk about today is, is touch. And um, we'll just briefly touch on this. Um, but um, of course, there's many other things we can talk about as well, but these um, are the main ones that we're using in AR VR. So um, the touch is part of the soma sensory system, which is a complicated set of nerves that uh, respond to change over the whole body. And in fact, the skin's the largest organ in the, in the body with almost uh, two meters of skin in adults. Um, some of us are bigger than others, so you know, 1.5 to 2 meters. Um, you've got tactile uh, receptors that um, are spread uh, unevenly across your body, obviously in your fingertips, um, your tongue, um, your face, you've got much more tactile receptors in other parts of the body, but you also have kinesthetic sense as well, so which measures when your muscles are moving, which is also part of that proprioception as well. So here's a quick crosser of the skin. Um, 
you have the epidermal layer and then you've got the dermal layer and then you've got through the dermal layer, you've got those nerves that provide that sense of, of touch. Um, there are a variety of different cells that respond to pressure and touch and motion at different frequencies. Um, so, for example, the Merkel discs, um, they respond at about 10 hertz, and they are very good at detecting edges or intensity of, of touch. Um, you've got these smaller corpuscles um, called the Paysian corpuscles that um, respond to acceleration and vibration. So if you start running, they'll, they'll, give, they'll um, send a signal out. One of the interesting things also is spatial resolution. You can try this yourself at home. If you take a piece of wood and put two nails in it, you can, um, or, or some way to move apart two pinpricks, you can see how accurate um, your body can detect, or what's the minimum detection rate of different um, separation between different senses of different touch points. So for example, the finger has a threshold typically of two to three millimeters, whereas on the back, you've got almost 40, 40 millimeters of separation before you can detect you've got two different touch points. And that shows you the uneven distribution of touch receptors. And as I said before, one of the really important things um, also for VR, of course, because in, in the VR case, oftentimes you can't see your virtual body. It's very important that the proprioception, which is the positioning of the sense and knowing where your body uh, joints are in space. And then there's also the kinesthesia, which is the movement um, sensation. So if you can, uh, touch your nose with your eyes closed that involves both proprioception and uh, kinesthesia and then of course when you actually touch your nose you get a touch a tactile feedback from your fingertip and, and your nose <laughs>